have a very robust uh, mentorship uh, uh, mentorship system. Uh, it's all institutionalized from the national level going down to the level of the community. Uh, we practice what we call on-site and off-site uh, mentoring system, uh, getting on board uh, all the stakeholders. We've also realized that traditionally over the past couple of years, we were focusing very much on nurses and clinicians and forgetting the data people, uh, forgetting the engineers, uh, forgetting our community health workers. So now we have this very comprehensive mentorship uh, approach that tackles the purely medical and non-medical uh, personnel within, uh, within the health system. Also looking at the people handling community engagement. So we also have uh, a mentoring approach uh, towards that. We've also had to harmonize an integrated supportive supervision approach for MNH. So in the past, it was done in parallel. So the maternal people would do it on their own and then the neonatal people would do it on their own. So as part and parcel of our integration efforts, now we have this comprehensive maternal newborn supportive <laughs> supervision tool. What we're hoping, fingers crossed, we will learn from this, we will be able to extend the pediatric component. So it becomes maternal newborn and child supportive supervision tool. On the ground, Sarah, yeah. it's the same looking after five-year-old, same thing hmm. looking at a two-day-old. So if I walk into a facility and I do supportive supervision for a neonate, and I come back three months later to do for a five-year-old, it actually doesn't make sense. Uh, so we're saying, you know, how do we better use resources and have a comprehensive integrated approach? Thank you. That's terrific. Um, I wonder if there's anyone on here who also feels like they can share if they've been involved in similar work or if they have questions, thoughts, comments about what uh, Queen or Dr. Sushma have just said. I'm going to model good behavior by having a cup of coffee because this is meant to be wandering around with a cup of coffee or some beverage in the middle of the night if it's later on for you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> okay. I think so if you can chime if I can chime in and Please just do. to add on um what Queen has just put together and mentioned. I think as part of the Nest 360 work uh that's currently going on in including Malawi and some some mm. of which um Queen has highlighted. I think their the efforts to provide better mentorship and most of this is mainly hands-on and getting people in health facilities just to spend time with health workers, not necessarily just nurses, but also doctors and biomedical engineers to appreciate the challenges and work with them uh, through some of the issues that they have, uh, they're experiencing. And this is after um, a five day training. And the value in this is that um, what we've seen over time is that people have given us very positive feedback of having higher levels of confidence and in terms of what they can do uh, in terms of care provision for babies and even for mothers, because some of the people we are working with are not, not, not only in newborn units, but also in maternity units. And I think, uh, mentorship plays a bigger role compared to the training because once you go to a health facility they are very there are some things that you just provide in a class-based system and when you walk into the unit then you actually find some things that don't really end up that the people you've trained wouldn't it have picked up in a very obvious way so we've gone to units and found teams having equipment that um, have disabled certain bits of equipment because they didn't know how to use them. And they say the equipment was, you know, had alarms beeping all the time. And so, for example, they would get rid of the uh, a thermal, uh, the thermal sensor on, an, on, a, on, a new, on, an, on a warmer because it wouldn't go quiet because they didn't want, know what it was. So those practical experiences are just um, empowering people at that level is very useful. And what we're doing now is identifying the people who are sort of the best in the class 
to take mm -hmm. them forward for more mentorship classes so that they can support health facilities around them uh, in very practical things such as those on, you know, how do you organize your unit? How do you go to, you know, even just going to the stores in the health facility and says, and seeing, can we just have a look at what you have for newborns? And, and you'd be surprised about how many equipment for newborn units are sitting in stores that people have no idea what they are for. Over. What they're doing yeah which reminds me about what dr sushma and 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 both and, and queen also said right that you know you need a crack team and you need the teams that need the capacity and the capability to be able to utilize this i think actually all our speakers sort of highlighted that uh, but i wonder um fatima you've made a a comment i think um about trying to adopt um catchment area based mentorship and shifting training more from uh to, to slightly different models. Do you, do you care to share a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you. So this is, a, um, as we all know that- uh, And maybe you, know, you can introduce uh, yourself briefly just okay. before, so yeah. Okay, some some colleagues know me, but not all of you. I'm Fatima Gohar, I work with UNICEF Regional Office uh, as maternal and newborn health specialist. So what we are, um, what we are trying to do here is um, the, the problem about which we all are aware that in-service training, like it, we have been giving them, but it's not, we have failed to institutionalize them. So every time we come up with, even for mentors, we bring in external bodies to give uh, mentorship, for example, if, if it could be an association or maybe a university, but then after funding, everything goes back to square one. So um, what we are trying here is to to come up with a with a model and a, a model which could then be institutionalized and sustained at their mm. own. So yeah. in that front, we are trying to uh, convert, uh, you know, divert hotel-based trainings to hospital-based. And then in the hospitals, what we want uh, maybe a district hospital or a provincial hospital or a national hospital to transform that national hospital into a training hub, a learning hub. First, a learning hub, having a learning facility like well-equipped training center with accessories of even um, virtual training. And secondly, with uh, have a equipped and functional skills lab. So these two, um, and then taking that to another uh, step where this facility must be recognized as a center of excellence. So it's not they're just preaching what is supposed to be, you know, the care, but they are practicing. So people are, workers are really, literally seeing the role models, best practices, not just theory sitting uh -huh. in the room. So, and then there's another layer to it also, which is still a gray area. We are still trying to figure it out how coming up with a, with a business model. So that's something which is still in pipeline, something which could okay. help then to sustain that effort. Uh -huh. You don't have to, and bring like bringing all this money which is out there with partners mm -hmm. to these facilities. So at the end of the day, these facilities have their services and then mentorship then could be inbuilt in it. So even we can, they can then utilize association uh, trainers or ministries trainer, trainers to do on the job coaching for the catch for their catchment area facilities of that particular learning hub or center of excellence. Over. Thank you. That's that's super helpful. Any anyone else want to share some of some thoughts about about this and how they they've been managing in the countries they they work in. Or maybe if, if you'd like to talk about other innovations that have been um, you, you've been involved in that have have been successful that you can share with with us. It sounds like Balram may may have something to share. I just saw that in the chat. Balram, feel free to to share if you're comfortable. Oh, maybe, maybe you're not, or maybe you're on mute. I don't know. Um, maybe.
Okay, perhaps, perhaps you're, not, you're not able to, to get through, but, uh, oh, sorry, did I hear something? Okay. Uh, all right. Well, maybe we can, we can jump onto another question that um, came up, which talked about, um, uh, we'd, we'd listened to Prof. Bogale sort of speaking in Ethiopia about um, how pediatricians had been major champions in setting up um, newborn care units and, and, and also thinking about KMC and work and, and, and operationalizing and enabling others, particularly neonatal nurses. And um, one question that Joy had asked was, are there any tips to other pediatric associations that any of our panelists care to share or anyone on this cocktail arc? feels comfortable sharing. And just a comment, Dr. Nangia, thank you for your, your comment in the chat. Um, she also has a comment on the mentoring methodology before oh, we jump on sure. to the comment. Sure, please feel free to jump in when you have something to, um, if you have something to contribute, anyone on the line, not just panelists, everybody, please. Yes. Yeah, so go ahead. Uh, so I, I heard the, uh, Dr. Fatima speak about the clinical care processes. I'm not, uh, pardon me for my ignorance, I'm not sure which area is she working in. Uh, so in India, what we've done is, uh, it's not just the training that you have trainings in the hotel. So it is a, it's actually a four day training, which is right there in the state in the district that where the people have to be trained and thereafter then they come for an observership visit to an established facility which is a neonatal facility which is uh, doing day-to-day -day clinical care and there are uh, these people who come as observers in a batch of about six people who are there as two doctors and four nurses and they come to the unit they are there for two weeks they observe every day what's happening there are some structured sessions which are taken and the rest of the day, they are mingling with the nurses and the residents, the fellows in the neonatal unit and actually seeing what's happening. So it's like we believe that seeing is learning, uh, not just in the clinic, in, not just in the training sessions. And thereafter, when they go back after three months is a team of mentors who goes and sees if they are able to implement what they saw or do they need some more help. So this is done in a structured manner. So we have regional centers across the country. And there are now state centers being established across all the 28 states where there'll be one medical school which will serve as the state center. In a bigger state like Uttar Pradesh, maybe there are two or three. So this is the model on which we are working. So we run the national center. There are others who are running the regional centers which are actual patient care areas. So they are like demonstration sites where people come from the districts and see what's happening and learn. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and then this is a, a general question. I think one of the bigger challenges is, is that has plagued so many, so many of us when, when we work is that, um, number one, how to maintain the skills of those who are trained or who have some mentoring experience um, very episodically, maybe once in every few years. And how do you maintain those skill sets if they're not being utilized all the time, for example, resuscitating a, a a sick baby or, or and then the other question is how how are we managing situations where often you have staff who are trained in a particular area and then within six months they are moved to another section say orthopedics or um you know the eye clinic because you know that's the system <laughs> can anyone share any experiences of how they've managed to solve for this or whether they're experiencing this um, on the line. And feel free to just speak up because it's difficult to see everybody on the screen. So just go ahead if you. Um. I can share our experience. It's from a very small setting. My name is Brooke. I'm with the DARA development and we Hi, have Brooke. worked. Hi, Cyril. Good to see you. Um, we have worked in Uganda for over 20 years, and especially in the first um, five years, we saw this 
all the time. And I think it was just continual communication with hospital administration, um, with the champions in the hospital, with the staff themselves and really creating that shared understanding of the importance. And I think over time, as, as those experts really developed in a the hospital, they also became advocates for that, that same topic that you're discussing. And I think mm -hmm. the administrators recognized what a benefit it was to everybody um, when that became common practice. And so now when we work other, with other institutions, I think we start that even before we arrive at the facility and really get that conversation topic going. And I think it's becoming uh, much more well known within the ministry. I think there's even a policy that they have. And then I think it's that the challenge of implementing it on the ground within that facility. And so kind of finding those people to keep pushing that same topic has been really helpful. And that, that's super helpful, Brooke. Thank, thank you. And, and I think you're also talking about it from the point of view of sort of, in a sense, in essence, starting block by block or facility by facility. And, and I think that's really important. I, I also wonder if the other examples of the folk who had to dealt with this at a, perhaps at the national level, or at a district level, or at a regional level, at a state level, uh, have those conversations happened? If I, if I may come in. Please. And maybe I'll invite Queen after you've spoken, because I know Malawi has been thinking very much about, about this and also had some efforts. But Sushma, please go ahead. Thank you for that. And uh, what we, how we have tried to tackle this, because we have been seeing a lot of attrition occurring about the, uh, regarding the people whom uh, people have trained and they're supposed to be working at the district level. So there is a GOI directive from the government of India. There is a directive to all the states that those who've been trained for newborn care, facility-based newborn care, they, they should not be removed from the facility where they are working. They should not be utilized for emergency services, for uh, something like uh, there is a they will not be the ones who will be moved as the first thing. So, and they should be working at the facility for at least three years. So if they report a burnout, sure, they can move out. But otherwise, if, they, if we have invested in them, at least for three years, they are at the facility where they're working. It is, it's not completely Thank you. It sounds like you're saying this is at a national level. It's almost like a government national policy. That's great. That's great. And who drove that effort? Was it, uh, how did we get to that? How did India get to that point? We realized as we were training people, and when we went down for mentoring three months later, those people were not there at the facility. And we were like, they had come from here, they had been trained, where are they? So they yeah. were thrown. They're posted to the blood bank, they're posted to the emergency, they're posted to some other facility out of that particular district. So then this was like feedback was given to the government of India. So we have a child health division, which is very active, the child health division within the Ministry of Health. So right. it was a GOI directive from there, which was endorsed by these senior bureaucratic uh, officials in the ministry. And now this has gone as a DO letter to uh, various states. So it's, it's now a done thing. That's great. That's great. And Queen, do you mind also um, sharing Malawi's perspective? As, as so, so for Malawi, our our, our challenge is um, uh, not somebody moving from District A to District B. Our challenge is under the situation uh, where within the same facility. But it's moved from uh, the maternity section uh, to the surgical section. Uh, um, uh, and uh, you would have invested quite a lot in the institution. Over the past years or so, we've, um, we've been working so much uh, with mm -hmm. uh, our managers at the national level, but also district level. Initially, we were told that this is a policy, and then it transpired that it's actually not a policy. Um, it was local arrangement within the facilities that then became uh, the norm. So as we speak now, um, 
for the tertiary facilities, we don't, we no longer do rotations. Most of the district hospitals, uh, we've uh, gotten it into an understanding that if somebody is uh, working within maternal or newborn health, uh, let them stay there unless we have major issues with a person. So even within the districts, these elements of rotation, uh, they've gone down. And, and again, we used data. We were able, we've had these conversations uh, for the past five years, Sarah. It was only when we produced data at facility level, district level on the impact of rotations. So depending on a facility, sometimes they'll do it every three months, every six months. And we were able to demonstrate that every time you move people, it takes you two months. So your maternal deaths, they increase, your neonatal deaths increase, uh, the pediatric deaths increase, and you kind of get to a plateau uh, on month number three. That's when you start to see a reduction. And uh, by the time you get to month number six, these people are being moved again. Uh, and this was a cycle we were able uh, to produce data for at least a year for all the facilities in Malawi, public facilities across the whole country. And when you look at that data, the graphs, it's very compelling. You, you, it must be, somebody must just be a very, very hard nut to crack, not to be convinced with the data. So one of the greatest lessons for, for me, it might look good, but you need to produce data to, 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 to back your point. And so with that data, uh, facilities have gone back to the drawing board and they've said, look, no, no, no. I think this rotation thing is actually harmful to us. Uh, uh, so we hope, because there was no policy around rotation. It was just a culture that was developed over years and everybody thought it was a policy. Uh, uh, the, the, the other thing with decentralization, with decentralization, it's really difficult uh, for somebody to move for, from one district to another district. So that element of decentralization has actually helped us a lot uh, to manage transfers within districts. For central hospitals, we're working to push uh, the auto autonomy. Uh, so central hospitals, once they are autonomous, uh, then even moving people from one central hospital to the other will be practically uh, nearly impossible unless there are special arrangements between the two tertiary facilities. Um, yes, yeah, so those are those, those would be uh, my comments. But just coming back to the mentorship issue, I think one of the things that uh, we need to get right is uh, how we institutionalize mentorship. So it is not a project. Uh, it, it, we don't have a special pool of mentors that go to these facilities uh, to mentor people. It becomes difficult to sustain it. In the, all these big facilities, nobody comes to mentor us. We've built in a system where the more senior person uh, uh, mentors the junior person and it moves on and on and on and on. We need to do exactly the same at the district level, at the health center level. And from the national level, regional level, we then just talk about supportive supervision. But mentoring should be inbuilt. And that's, that's, uh, that's uh, the, the approach that we're taking in Malawi. That in the next two years or so, in as far as mentoring is concerned, because we have seen your nest midwives, we de we've developed a neonatal nest training uh, course. We have now bachelor's level clinical officers uh, for pediatrics. Those people are working in the districts. Why can't they spearhead the mentoring uh, uh, processes? Why should somebody come from the ministry headquarters? to go down and mentor somebody at the health center. So th these, these are some of the things that we need to think about. I posed a question in the chat and that's where I will stop. Uh, on this element of mentoring health managers. Uh, this is a, 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 an area that we kind of forget. Yet these are the people that make decisions over where the money goes, how money is spent, uh, who does what, resource, I mean, uh, in terms of health workers, how many are hired? Who is mentoring them? Do we have a system within our countries that mentors uh, these uh, health managers at all levels of the facilities? I'm really curious to learn from the other countries if somebody has experience on a mentoring system for health managers. Thank you. 
Well said, Queen. Well said. I, I heard so many themes in what you said. I heard the value of actually having data to make the case. And it's really, this is almost like a continuous quality improvement to be able to demonstrate what the losses have been and the tremendous uh, inefficiency of having to keep moving people in a, in a hospital and then the, the terrible cost that of lives and the morbidity. And then I've also heard this question about mentorship. And I wonder if I'll open it up to the floor, if anyone has comments on mentorship, especially of um, uh, ma managers. Please feel free to chime in. Hi, hi. Um, this is Anne-Marie from South Africa speaking. Um, Anne-Marie! Yes, long time <laughs> on the team. Um, uh, Fatima asked me just to share with you um, a, a kind of a mentorship way in which things work in South Africa. Uh, around 2011, um, the Minister of Health instituted a clinical, um, um, clinical specialist team um, in each um, district. They are called district clinical specialist teams and they are supposed to now assist with all these different facilities and um, uh, other places that, that they are to um, facilitate the, the reduction of the, the maternal and um, neonatal mortality. So a district clinical specialist team consists or uh, the ideal team, obviously there are always vacancies somewhere. The ideal team consists of um, a pediatrician and a neonatal nurse, an obstetrician and a midwife, a family physician and a primary healthcare nurse, and then also an anesthetist to assist, you know, whether there are the, the issue of, for example, cesarean sections in, in the district hospitals. And they are not, they are linked to the system. So they are not, a, uh, they, they do um, sort of, uh, uh, they have to keep up their skills in at least one of the facilities in the dis, in in the um, in the district. So, uh, if you are the pediatrician in the um, team, you have to you are also on call and do sessions at one of the tertiary hospitals, for example. If you are a family physician, it would be at a district hospital and so forth. So that they are all the time they have to keep up their clinical skills, but they have uh, the function of mentoring and supporting each of the different facilities at the different levels, especially at the primary health care, which in South Africa also includes the district hospitals. So they would be going around to all the um, clinics and the health centers and the um, district hospitals, and they would, for example, uh, also assist with conducting the emergency obstetric training drills, you know, to, to keep those skills up. And also to, they, they would be, they are intimately involved in the um, mortality and morbidity review meetings at the different um, um, parts of the district and so forth. So um, that was sort of a, a model that was um, created to try to also support and mentor um, broader than just, you know, one from one facility to the other. Thank you. Oh, that's great, Anne-Marie. Thank you for, for sharing this. Any, any questions, thoughts, comments, reactions from anyone? Again, feel free to pipe up. Well, building on this theme, and especially because of COVID times and the um, decreased ability to travel, um, even within country, I'm curious if you've seen any models being done virtually for sharing practices or training, if that's changed during COVID specifically for this space, or if that was happening already. Um, we know of some amazing examples in India through their virtual trainings and the apps so maybe uh, Dr. Nangia, you can speak to that, but if anyone else has other um, innovations for more of a virtual mentorship or training that isn't always done in person, we'd be curious about that too.
Kimberly, you were hoping that maybe Dr. Sushma might say a word or two. Sure, if you don't mind. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, yes, that uh, that's right. Uh, that during the COVID time, uh, some of the aspects that have changed in terms of training, because these physical trainings are no more being conducted uh, to the same extent. So there are uh, other things like webinars and some of the sessions where some aspects are sent to them beforehand. Uh, digitally, they would go through those apps, some of the videos that they would watch. And then, then we have a Q&A kind of session where they can ask questions or they can come up with some of the uh, uh, clinical problems that they are facing in terms of managing some baby or some aspects and uh, that's taken care of. So it's not formalized in a, you know, in a perfect manner, but that's how things are moving. And many of these trainings are now being done in, in part in terms of some of the things being done online and a very little which is being done offline from the people from within the health system there, rather than people traveling down and helping out. Skill labs, of course, are coming up in a big way and they are replacing a lot of these uh, travel and trainings even before the COVID time set in. So at the skill labs, people are being trained within their own district or within the within the state. So that's that's taking up, but it's not like universal all across. Thank you, Dr. Sushma. I'm, I'm seeing a lot and a number of people talking about the, the power of WhatsApp. And maybe at the same time, that sort of talks a little bit about bandwidth and costs to Zoom and Teams and some of these other things. And anyone care to talk a little bit about that? Care to share some of their experiences there? Have some folk evaluated any mentorship programs or conducted any mentorship programs using WhatsApp? It might be nice to hear from David. You were mentioning your hybrid model. Could you could you maybe explain that in a little more detail? Yeah, so, so this pretty much linked to training for newborn care service providers uh, providing care within newborn units. And what we had in the past, and, and it's pretty similar to what's happened in Malawi, is we had a five-day training that had was very well um integrated to have a theoretical session where you explain the principles behind the intervention and then have a session to do the actual practical and with covid uh then that was not possible and we had to go back to the drawing board where all the theoretical concepts were pulled together into a three-day session where all the aspects of the theories behind the intervention or how to do why uh, why to provide certain interventions together the need to link with other professionals was done in a three-day session and um, a two-day session where we had much fewer uh, people in person in terms of trainers having to travel to you know specific hospitals or training centers to actually now work with hospitals and and healthcare providers to learn the more practical based skills and that created an, an aspect of we do have people in a virtual room, including you know up to three different training sites being trained on theoretical concepts all at one for three days and have a split team going to all the three different units for two days each. And that that has you know increased the number of people you can train at a, at, at any single time, but also reduced uh, the amount of travel for the teams that you need to go to the fields. And also the interactions, and and that has helped, you know, at this period where interactions and physical meetings were sort of a challenge. But I agree, also webinars have played a very great role to sustain some of that learning and and opportunities for people to learn from one another. Over. Cyril, this is Susan Niermeyer. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been 
working on translating Helping Babies Breathe and the essential newborn care resources um, that the Academy developed into more digital formats. Um, and as you say, WhatsApp is a very economical option for distributing PDFs of the facilitator flip chart, the provider guide, and then Zoom or even video chats within WhatsApp can be used for mentoring the simulation um, practices and giving feedback to learners with their neonatal simulators. Uh -huh. so that, that has proven to be a wonderful way to um, rekindle the, the refresher uh, learning around essential newborn care and hopefully even extend it to some new areas that have not been reached before. That's great. That's great, Susan. Thank you for sharing that. Super, super helpful. I think Trish and Kirsten, I, I think you have some questions as well. Yeah, I think as we're, we're approaching, I think the last minutes of this session, um, I, I wondered if we could shift a little bit thinking of, especially the White Ribbon Alliance that was just uh, the, the topic that was just um, discussed in the plenary um, around inclusion of the mother and all the chat that was going on around co-design, how do we ensure that the maternal perspective is included in improving quality of care? And I wondered if we could just ask, you know, what innovations, what have you all seen or, or implemented, or maybe you're just envisioning around how can we improve overall response Care as part of patient newborn care experience. And some of that has to do with actual infrastructure. I think we all know often what happens is the mother is separated from that baby. There is no, it becomes challenging for any um, uh, initiating any kind of breastfeeding. So there are many things that, that factor um, into this. And so I'd love to just hear from the group here, any thoughts around reimagining this from the maternal perspective? I think just maybe if I can chime in first is, um, I think one of the, at, at least from the experiences of the work that we've done in Kenya, and feedback involving mothers and just asking them about the experiences of care provided in newborn units. Uh, one of the things that they said is if someone would just spend some time to tell them what to expect within the newborn unit. Um, this is a very unique environment from any, any person generally has never seen the inside of a newborn unit. It's not your typical place where you go and visit anyone who is sick in a hospital. Most people have seen the inside of a medical ward, a surgical ward, um, a maternity unit, a newborn unit is high risk. It's, it's a very unique environment and people don't know what to expect. They don't know what the different interventions are. And I think the work that you, that part is leading on creating that virtual environment, that could also include about the different interventions and what they mean and what, and what to expect to see then um, that provides a very unique opportunity uh, to provide in terms of, um, you know, a virtual, it's, a, it's something that can be played in the maternity unit as a video that people watch, that they know if your baby is sick, they're taken to the newborn unit, this is what to expect. This is why we you wash your hands, this is how you express breast milk, this is where your milk is stored. And what is an NGT, what does it mean? Um, I think that would be a very, very um, game-changing uh, um, way of communicating to mothers. Over. Thank you, David. Um, Brooke, it looks like you want to say something. Yes, I just wanted to, um, to, to follow up with David's point. I completely agree with you. And we recently implemented a program called Hospital to Home, where we did a lot of the things that you were mentioning. It was a combination of, um, of really 
ensuring um, neuroprotective care and really mother's education was the, the focus in the facility and then bridging that with at home follow up care for high risk newborns. And we spent a lot of time, um, like you're saying, making sure those mothers understood what was happening and, and really spending a lot of time making sure they understood what would be happening to their baby once they went home. And one of the things we learned in the qualitative research was that the, the staff within the facility had developed such a deep respect of the parents and of those mothers. And whereas before they often felt that they had all the expertise that, that the, the moms would not perhaps be able to understand what was happening or why it was happening through this process of really just bringing together those moms and the staff, they really became this uh, family-centered care team. And it was, um, I think it was intentional, but it, it really grew even more organically than we had expected. And it was just really, really powerful to see that. And those moms were so empowered when they went home and were hoping that that resulted in better care for their babies once they were at home. Thank you, Brooke. And it, it makes a point that I know that just speaking personally, the first time I stepped onto a, a neonatal intensive care unit, I literally couldn't wait to get out. And I literally run out after the obligatory two hours as a medical student. And it's one of the biggest ironies and privileges that I'm, I'm privileged to work with newborns because I was so terrified. So I totally resonate with what you're saying, Brooke. <laughs> um, Trish, I think you wanted to ask something as well. Yeah, no, basically just what uh, Kirsten was saying about, you know, innovation and co-creation and, um, you know, if there are any particular innovations that people know about that have been developed at the country level, we obviously are most aware of what's going on in the four countries that we're working in for this project. But, you know, especially um, Brooke with Adara's work, I think maybe you guys might have some good innovations that, um, you know, we might be able to also uh, include in our in our summary um, of this area. So. Oh, I think Queen wants to say something. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't, I'm failing to raise my hand. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on uh, the conversation around this nurturing uh, a care. Uh, we, we tend uh, to talk about the mother and uh, forget the father. Um, I, I, I think we need to start to talk about uh, family, uh, allowing uh, the father, the mother, access to their baby, but also, you know, even in the management of these babies, there are cultural uh, perspectives um, in, the, in, in the developed setting, the way this particular element is very different from our setting. A and we need to tackle this from both ends, both from uh, the, the provision of care, but also from the demand creation. We need to get our people to start to demand their involvement uh, in the management of their babies. If there's no demand, even if we talk amongst ourselves, uh, change is hard, it's hard to change. Uh, so sometimes you need a little bit of push uh, from your client uh, to change. So we've been talking about this uh, within our circles. I'm, I'm talking about Sub-Saharan Africa. But 85% of our women are coming from the rural areas, from poor families. The educational level, they haven't really gone far with education. They actually think I'm doing them a massive favor uh, by looking after their baby. Uh, they don't know I get paid. It's just my job. And, 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 and so it's, we, we need to change this. Unless we figure out a way of creating the demand this will be a conversation amongst ourselves. Uh, I, I've been trying to figure out how do you create these parent voices within the Sub-Saharan region that actually help in creating the demand. How, how do you exactly do all that? And I was hoping, I know our time is up. I was hoping that we would touch a little bit about financing 
for inpatient care for the small and sick newborn. This is a subject that we haven't uh, had time to discuss. Uh, people think it's, uh, it's a cheap thing to do, but uh, when you're looking at care for the small and sick newborn, it's money. And, and how do we advocate uh, for financing for care for the small and sick newborn? Thank you. Any reactions, anybody? I could see a lot of heads nodding. Go ahead. Remember, no hands up, just speak. Thank you, Cyril, for that. Uh, but regarding this financing aspect, which has been brought up, it's really crucial. And the government of India has been very sensitive about this aspect. So there is something called as Ayushman Bharat, so which is like uh, long live India or have a healthy life. So in that, we have packages for newborn care and for maternal care, which are taken care by the government. And the family doesn't have to really spend both for maternal care as well as for the child's care till one year of age. So right from her pregnancy till one year of age, and there is no out of pocket expenditure expected. And this is all taken care by the state or by the health. And the new scheme that has come is Ayushman Bharat, which is a recent addition to it, which has packages for many other aspects. Maternal newborn care was a part of it from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Shashma. All right. I think we're 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 on the on the wind down now. So, any last comments, thoughts that anyone would like to share? Please just pipe up. Don't put up your hand. Yep, so if I can just say one last thing in maybe that seconds or a minute. Um, it, I think we also need to recognize that some of the environments that healthcare workers, and especially in LMIC settings, work in are very difficult with very limited um, staffing, very high workloads. And we definitely need to start thinking about how to care for them and how to look after them. And some of those opportunities include just helping them, um, you know, maybe opportunities for debrief. I, I, some of the newborn units are very high mortality settings and you have to break bad news every day. And some people get numb to bad news and facing life out there. So I think it's an opportunity and something that we need to think about um, how to look after the care and so that we give them energy to keep going over. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, gosh, we've had such a rich conversation. I think we've, we, we've, we've shared a little bit about the respectful care and what we need to do and how we need to almost change the paradigm, right? To, to have a, a much more family participatory care model, if you like, um, where we're looking at, uh, and Queen, I think you said it best, so sort of that demand model. I mean, we've got a very that tends to be, I think, when you have healthcare workers and public health folk, you know, that sort of supply and orientation. But we've got to continue to push to have that demand, um, that 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 families and, and family voices can coalesce, not just to advocate to the public health group, but actually, I think, to also advocate to at national level, and because that's where the policies are driven, and that's where the politicians are. A vote. And I think we've also got to make the economic case. I love the example of being able to actually make the economic case for why it's really uh, suboptimal, uh, terribly unfortunate when we keep moving staff around and then, then there's this terrible toll. Uh, we've also talked about um, engagement within the innovations using WhatsApp and even within that modern component you know, having PDFs and training sessions within there. And that's something that I think we've got a lot that, um, a lot of scope to build on and to, and then also the power of actually data and harnessing all these, all these great ideas and, and assessing whether they, how effective they are. So that again, we can move towards that sort of broader sustainability and, and hit those SDG goals that I think we're all so 
desirous to be able to, to get to. So perhaps on that note, I will thank everybody so much for participating. It always is such a pleasure to, to see so many wonderful faces, friendly faces, colleagues from all over the world. And even though we can't be with each other in person, we've at least managed in this part of the innovations of COVID. And we look forward to being able to see each other and give each other hugs and um, celebrate um, life. So thank you all very, very much. And please be safe and take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you.